Would you take out your Discover cards? And I want you to write today's word. Every day, every Sunday, we have a key word or phrase. And today's key word for the teaching is hostage. Hostage. So just write that down. We'll come back to it at the end of the teaching. We're in a series called God on Earth. It's a study of the Gospel of John. It was written by Jesus' good friend, John. And he wrote for one particular purpose. So that everyone who reads this will actually believe that Jesus is God on earth. We're going to be in chapter 11 today if you brought your Bibles. If you didn't, there's a chair Bible in front of you underneath. It's a paper Bible. We're going to be on page 748. By the way, if you don't own a Bible, just take it home. You are not stealing. It's a gift. We buy them by the case. Seriously. Just take it home and read it. And while I'm doing that, let me give a little tidbit because there are some of you that are brand new to following Jesus. Take the Bible home, stop by the cafe, there's a wall of brochures there, pick up a brochure that says, what about finding God? It'll give you some really great first steps on how to get your spiritual life going and start reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you're done with that, what should they read? Matthew, Mark. And when you're done with the second time, then you read... Yeah, you got it. Okay, that's right. Because we find out about Jesus when we read the stories of Jesus. So today, we're going to talk about one of the most famous stories of Jesus, and it has to do with another one of his good friends. We're going to pray and go right to work. Let's pray. Jesus, today is Father's Day, and I want to thank you for being my good friend and introducing me to your father, who has now become my father. And every day is the Father's Day. But today we have set aside a particular day to honor fathers. I want to pray for every father in this room that they will take responsibility to be the pastor of their home. Youth workers, children's workers spend about 40 hours a year influencing our children's lives. We spend hundreds and hundreds of hours every month. I pray that you will fill up the heart of every father so they will transfer that to their children as well. Remind us that we never need to be held hostage in this life again. In Jesus' good name we pray, amen. The story today has to deal, has to do with Jesus' good friend Lazarus who died temporarily. Now, very few people have that experience, but Lazarus did. He died temporarily. And there are three scenes to this story. We're going to deal with scene number one, beginning at verse one in chapter 11, the temporary death of Lazarus. Here it is. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now verse 6 And verse 7 are stunning verses. Let me tell you why. If you had a good friend and you told that good friend that you were dying, wouldn't you expect that that good friend would come see you? Jesus hears that his good friend Lazarus is dying and deliberately doesn't go to see him. What would you think of me if you called me and said, Pastor, my wife's been in a terrible accident. She's in the emergency room. It's touch and go as to whether she's going to live or not. And my response to you was, hey, thanks for the update. Bye. What would you think of me? What would you think of that situation? You wouldn't think very much at all. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Every disciple knows that Lazarus is his good friend. Every single one of them. And it might be that this is the beginning of the seeds of futility that come out a little bit later. Maybe they said, well, there's nothing Jesus can do. That's why he's not going. Jesus decides then to actually go back to Judea. Now, Jesus understands what's going on here. 
And Jesus, who is God on earth, knows that God wants to use this situation for his Father's glory and also to glorify him. Now, this is an interesting request because there are actually three requests similar to this. That people make a request of Jesus, he says no, and then later compel, or complies and grants their request. The first one was with his mother. They were standing in line at a reception line at a wedding. They ran out of wine. Mom turns to Jesus and says, hey, they're out of wine. His response is, so? What am I supposed to do? My time is not yet. And then later on, he went and made wine. A few weeks ago, we studied that the Jew, uh, one of the Jewish feasts was happening. The whole family, all of Jesus' brothers are all going up to the feast, and Jesus says, I'm not going. They go, oh, you got to go. You got to go. You're becoming a public figure. You have to go. People be asking for you. Jesus says, no. And then a few verses later, he turns around and goes. Here, Lazarus' sisters make a compelling request. Our brother is dying. Come. Jesus says, I'm going to stay here for a couple of days. Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus' denials or Jesus' delays are not denials. When Jesus delays, it's not saying no. Jesus didn't turn the water into wine because his mother said, would you do this, honey? He turned the water into wine because the father said, I want you to do that. Jesus didn't go to the feast because his brothers compelled him. Jesus went to the feast because the father guided him there. And Jesus doesn't go to Lazarus when Mary and Martha ask him to come. He goes when the father tells him to go. Jesus has proven over and over and over again. He only does what the father tells him to do. He only says what the father tells him to say. Now, we've covered this extensively in past sermons. So if you want to go back, you can go to our website at thecreeksidechurch.org or you can download the church app, Creekside Church app, and all of the podcasts are available there right at the touch of your finger. So I hope that you'll do that. So Jesus then now declares to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Verse 8, they respond. Because this is where the Jews tried to stone Jesus. He's going back into dangerous territory. Look how they respond in verse 8. But Rabbi, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you there. Yet you are going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in daylight will not stumble. For they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble. For they have no light. Have, have you ever read the Bible and you're reading along and all of a sudden the words of Jesus just seem like they're gone off into left field? Like they're saying, why are you going back there? They're going to stone you. Have you not recognized that there are 12 hours of light in the day? You're going, ah, this is like two plus two equals potatoes. I don't get this. Why does Jesus respond this way? When you're reading the Bible, if you're a new Christian, when you're reading the Bible, if you're an old Christian, when you're reading the Bible and you come across something you don't understand, stop, underline it, pray for a moment. Just don't, don't read the Bible like you read the newspaper. Ask God to talk to you. What does this mean? Because these are insightful words Jesus is giving his disciples. He's actually referring to the light that his life gives. There is a limited amount of time of daylight. There's 12 hours of daylight. There's a limited amount of time. I'm going to be giving light to the world. Walk in this light. As long as you walk in this light, you're not going to stumble. In other words, I have nothing to be afraid of. They tried to stone me there. It doesn't matter where I go. I am not afraid because Jesus walked as someone who fully trusted in the Father. You can walk as someone who fully trusts in the Father. Think about the details of your life right now. Some of you are having trouble focusing on this teaching because situations in your life are demanding your attention and your mind keeps drifting back to those circumstances. The Father is greater than what you are facing. Let Jesus be your model and walk as someone who fully trusts the Father. So now Jesus tells them, I have nothing to be afraid of. And he addresses the issue in verse 11. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him. 
The disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let us go. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let's also go that we may die with him. What a cheery guy. (laughs) Everybody has a Thomas in their life. Wait a minute, things might get worse. Let's hold on. I mean, Thomas just always brings some kind of bad news for a while. Now, let's walk through this. Jesus tells his disciples that Lazarus is asleep because death is used as a euphemism or sleep is rather used as a euphemism for death. So Jesus tells him Lazarus is sleeping and I'm going to wake him. It was a common Jewish saying in the day that to, that to call a righteous man sleeping that a righteous man never touched death, or death never touched a righteous man. So Jesus is actually calling Lazarus a righteous man in that moment. And the disciples are saying, okay, we're going to go see him. He's asleep. You're referring to death through a euphemism, but it can't actually mean real death because you can't do anything about death. In the disciples' minds, it never even hit their radar screen that Jesus could conquer death. Okay, he can walk on water, he can feed thousands of people, he can heal the sick, but death, out of bounds, too far. They had God in a box. One of the things that holds us hostage is when we try and put God in a box. Everybody tries to do it. You are no exception. We all do that from time to time. They can't grasp that Jesus could overcome death. So Jesus then says to them, no, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there so that you can see what God wants to bring about. Then Thomas pops up and it says Thomas, who is called Didymus. Thomas is his Hebrew name. Didymus is his Greek name. They both mean twin. Uh, One commentator said that uh, it may be that Thomas actually looked like Jesus. So they look similarly. Maybe that's why he was called the twin. We don't know. Either way, as they go back into Judea, Jesus' life will be threatened. Thomas, if he looks like Jesus, is going to be a target as well. So Thomas says, he's very futile in his, in his look. Everybody's dead. Lazarus is dead. Jesus is going back to be with Lazarus. He's going to be dead. Let's all go be dead with Jesus. <laughs> New Testament Eeyore. He just can't see anything good here. Now, you know what's interesting? Is that later on, Thomas actually will die for Jesus. But it's after Thomas finds hope in Jesus. Thomas, in about two weeks, is going to make this statement. I don't believe Jesus rose from the dead, not unless I can put my fist in the side where the spear went or my fingers in the holes where the nails went. I'm not going to believe. Jesus shows up, looks at Thomas and says, I'm alive. Put your hand where you want to. Here's the holes in my hand. Believe, don't doubt anymore. And the Bible says that Thomas never doubted from that day forward. In fact, history tells us Thomas, Mr. Feudal Thinking, Mr. Hopelessness to the max, Thomas went further in missionary service than any of the other disciples or apostles. He went to southern India where he died for Jesus while preaching the gospel in a very, very powerful way. He angered the local pagan priest who picked up a spear and stabbed him through while he is preaching. Thomas would die for Jesus, but it would be a number of years before he would do that. Here's what we know. When we're close to Jesus, we have hope. When we're far away, we think futilely. When we are far from Jesus, our heart is ripe for feelings of futility, hopelessness. When we're close to Jesus, we sense hope. Write that down in your Bible. Because one of these days, you're going to feel hopeless. You're going to feel like the situation is futile. And you're going to recognize that you are far from Jesus. You just cannot be close to Jesus and feel hopeless. It's impossible. You just can't. So even though Thomas was standing right next to Jesus, he still didn't get it. In the same way that you can be in a church and hear the gospel and not follow Jesus. You can be surrounded by other Christians and still not know God. Do you understand that knowing God doesn't move you forward? 
Believing in God will not help you. Hello. Let me cite a very clear theological example. The devil thoroughly believes in God. It doesn't help him. So for you to say that you believe in God, you're on the same theological ground as the devil. That does not move you forward, folks. Only knowing Jesus as God on earth enters you into the family of God. That opens the door to scene two. Jesus begins to bring comfort. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now let's stop and do the math. It took a day to get the message to Jesus. Jesus waits two days. Then he goes on the fourth day, which is today. Verse 18. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Now, there was a Jewish tradition, which I found very interesting. There's a Jewish tradition that said the soul of a departed person would kind of stay in the region for three days, trying to get back into the body of that dead person. But after three days, it was hopeless. That person could never come alive again. Isn't it interesting that Jesus waits until four days before he shows up at Lazarus' tomb? It's like Jesus said, I don't care what your tradition is. I don't care what your ritual is. I'm bigger than any box you build. I will smash the walls down. Jesus will not be held hostage by our own traditions. Jesus wants everybody to know that he is greater than that. Jesus has power over life and over death. All right, verse 21, he arrives on the scene. Martha says to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now, Jesus is looking for faith in Martha. And Martha has this mixture of disappointment and faith. Lord, I believe that whatever you ask God for, he will do for you. Uh, By the way, I wish you would have been here. This problem wouldn't have been here. I'm grateful you're here to comfort us. Uh, If you'd have been here, we wouldn't have needed any comfort. Thank you for coming. Why did you wait so long? Do you sense the mixture? Can anybody relate to that? I want to follow you, Jesus, but... I'm stuck on what happened. The theological question here is, does God ever make a mistake? Now, before you rush to answer that, I want you to think it through. Because intellectually, we all know, no, God never makes a mistake. He's perfect. He's all-knowing. He's all-present. He's all-powerful. God never makes a mistake. That's our brain talking. If you answer that question from an emotional point of view, most of you would say, I'm not sure, which is code for maybe. Maybe he did make a mistake. Because right now you're thinking about a situation in your life where you pleaded with God, oh God, help me. And apparently God never showed up. God, I cried out to you to save my marriage. I pleaded with you. I've been divorced for three years now. How did that happen? I didn't want to end up pregnant as a single mom, but here I am. I didn't want to lose my job, but here I am. I didn't want my baby to die, but here I am. I didn't want this. I wanted that. Oh, God, I called out to you, and you weren't there for me. If only you would have been there, this would have happened. Every single one of us have had the words of Martha come out of our own mouth in one way or another. Jesus says to Martha, I am. Your brother will rise again because I am the resurrection and the life. Now, when Jesus looked at Martha and he says these words, I am the resurrection and the life. He reaches back into the Old Testament, which we have seen Jesus do five times before. This is number six, and he will do it two more times in this book. 
When Moses stood before God at the burning bush, God said, tell, he said to God, tell me your name. And God said, my name is I am that I am. And when Jesus reaches out to Martha with his words and says, I am the resurrection and the life, he is borrowing the name of God for himself. He is calling himself God on earth. He is saying to Martha, the I am is standing in front of you. I am the resurrection and the life. This is the sixth time Jesus opened up his ministry saying, I am the bread of life. Then he said, I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Now I am the resurrection and the life. Every time Jesus uses those two words, I am, he is taking the name of God as his own name, claiming to be God in front of everyone who hears him. Jesus is declaring boldly that he is God on earth. And he is challenging her in his thinking, is there anything too hard? Martha leaves. Martha goes back to get her sister. Look at verse 28. Martha called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said. He's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? That's the crux right there of this entire story. Couldn't this man who fed the thousands, walked on water, and healed the sick, couldn't this man have kept him from dying? It's too bad now that Jesus wasn't here. Not only does Martha say it, Mary shows up at Jesus' feet. Martha said it standing. Mary falls to her feet. It falls to Jesus' feet, starts weeping. Oh, Lord, if you would have been here. And she's in agony. She's moved. And Jesus is not angry with her, but he is moved deeply in his spirit because of the agony she's going through. I want to suggest something to you. I want to suggest that when Jesus heard that his good friend Lazarus was sick, that it was incredibly difficult for him not to go. But he submitted to the ways of the Father and stayed behind because he knew what the Father wanted to do. And there are times when you and I are called upon to obey God and it is incredibly difficult and nobody else understands. Yet you stand strong because you are in the middle of the story. It's only at the end when you look back. And right now, Mary is in the middle. Martha is in the middle. And all of these people are in the middle saying, couldn't he who used to do these powerful things, couldn't he have kept this man from dying? Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus never brings resolution to the problem. Jesus is resolution to the problem. When Jesus shows up, the problem has been met. It's enough for you to have Jesus. You don't need a job. Jesus is enough. He will bring the job to you that you need. But right now, you need to know that it's not a job you need. It's your connection with Jesus that you need. It's not a man in your life you need. It's your connection to Jesus. It's not a baby in your family that you need. It's your connection to Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't bring resolution. Jesus is the resolution to the problem that you're facing. It's only when Mary and Martha understood that, looking back, that they got it. Which brings us to scene three, verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, Martha objects, the sister of the dead man. By this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Remember, no embalming, hot Climate, four days, bad odor. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Now, 
It says that Jesus is deeply moved in verse 38. Let me talk about those words for a moment because it's not just emotionally moved. Jesus is moved, the Greek language tells, tells us, with anger, with indignation. One commentator said, Jesus wasn't deeply moved with emotion when he came to the tomb. He was moved like a wrestler going into the ring, absolutely determined to destroy his opponent. And Jesus' opponent was death. What Jesus is doing right now in confronting death with Lazarus is a foreshadowing of what the last half of the book of John is all about where Jesus deals with death for all mankind. This is a picture of what will happen. So Jesus is deeply moved. Martha says, no, don't pull the stone away. Don't embarrass yourself. Don't get that bad odor. We're all going to be remembering terrible things. Don't do this. Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you'd believe, you would see the glory of God? Verse 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen with a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had, and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. This is the foreshadowing of Jesus conquering death. Because Jesus dying on the cross will bring about the death of death. Jesus' death on the cross, the instrument of death, will prove to be the death of death. And Jesus is foreshadowing this right now. No one here doubts that Lazarus is dead. The girls say, no, don't open the tomb. It's going to stink. It's terrible. Let's not do that. But in Jesus' prayer, he again asserts that he only does what he sees the Father doing. He only says what he hears the Father saying. And after praying, he calls in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now, Lazarus came out. One commentator said he had to call Lazarus or everyone who is dead would come. So Jesus singles Lazarus out and out he comes. And there's two miracles that happen. The first one is that Lazarus came back to life. The second one is that he came out. You'll notice in the scripture, it says that he was bound with strips of linen. What happened in those days is there was no embalming process at all. And so in order for family to come for a funeral service, they would have to preserve them for at least a short period of time. So they would wrap them with strips of linen that were dipped in kind of a gooey, honey consistency substance of aroma, aromatic uh, flavor, or, uh, aromas and all of that scents. And they would wrap that body around and around as much as 75 pounds worth of gooey, sticky, smelly stuff with a napkin over their face. So when Lazarus came out, quite seriously, he resembled more of a mummy than he did a man. That's why Jesus said, take the grave clothes off of him. Now imagine that for a moment. Imagine this, okay? Imagine that you are the one that's called upon to take the grave clothes off this man. The dried, sticky stuff. You got a knife. You're trying to cut it apart. You're peeling it linen by linen, strip, and you can't believe that 10 minutes ago, the guy was dead. And he's been dead for four days. And you are seeing the glory of God. There's something incredibly powerful that is happening in that moment. Everyone is in awe. Are you tracking with me? Now let me ask you the most important question of the day because it has to do with Mary and Martha and you. Do you think in that moment... When everyone is standing there watching Lazarus stand upright while people are taking the grave clothes off of him, mumbling to one another about how this happened, do you think for one moment that both Mary and Martha, who said exactly the same thing, oh Lord, if you'd have been here, this problem wouldn't have happened. Do you think for a moment that Mary and Martha are still sad that Jesus didn't show up? Do you think they're still held hostage by their disappointment, by their unfulfilled expectations? You see, when you get a bigger picture of Jesus, the disappointment goes away. When you get a bigger picture of God's plan, all the unfulfilled expectations just melt. They're gone. And you see from God's perspective, in fact, the only time that you and I are ever disappointed, the only time that futility ever reigns in our life is when we don't see things from God's perspective. 
So my question to you is what unfulfilled expectation in your life still holds you hostage? Where in your life did you say, oh God, you never showed up for me? Those of you that have read my story and turn around pastor at the bookstore or wherever, to remember a story where I told that I had been fired from my previous church and it was humiliating and I was angry with God and I'm driving home and I'm just pissed. I'm just so angry. Why could you do this? I pulled over in my son's grade school and for 15 minutes I just let God have it with a prayer that I can't repeat publicly. And I was just emotionally exhausted at the end of it. You can't be that honest with God without hearing back from him. And in that quiet moment, God's spirit spoke to me and he says, I did this for you. You did what? You brought all this pain into my life for my benefit? You brought all this pain for my good? How, how, how does that work out? I don't get that at all. The vision that you want to see accomplished through your life would crush you. If I didn't first build strength inside you. I had to build this in you. Through hard times. So that you could stand strong. To see the vision come about. It's your vision in me. That compelled me to take you through the tough time. Have you ever had to give somebody bad news? You say to them. I'm going to be your friend all the way through that. I look back on that. That conversation with God happened 22 years ago and I thought the dream was dead. You know what? You're the dream. Creekside Church is the dream. I had a dream of so many small groups with hundreds of people and multiple campuses and all that and it was all gone in a moment and Jesus took it all and gave it back for the benefit of his kingdom. But believe me, I'm a different person. You wouldn't like me then. I didn't like me then. I thank God that he brought disappointment that set me free from being a hostage to the past. You can be set free. I want you to bow your heads and leave your eyes open and just look at your card where you wrote the word hostage. Where have you been held hostage by your past? Jesus set Mary and Martha free when he showed up. Jesus will set you free as he shows up in your life today. Were you held hostage by a disappointed marriage or a financial crisis or what's going on in your body physically? Wherever it is, I want you to write down where you have been held hostage in the past. And as soon as you have written that down and you want to give that back to God to make sure that you will never, ever, ever be held hostage again. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to slip out from where you are seated and come and line right across the front. And I want to pray with those of you. I know that's a bold action. I understand that. We do that very rarely around here, but we're going to do it today. I'm going to have everybody in the room stand. Would you do that with me right now? And I'm going to have you bring almost like a get-out-of-jail card, all right? I'm going to have you bring your Discover card out because it's a card of freedom. I will not be held hostage any longer by disappointments from the past, by unfulfilled expectations. God, I want you to enlarge my picture of what you are doing in my life, and I want to walk in freedom. If you want to walk in freedom, I'm going to invite you to slip out from where you're standing right now and just line right across the front. Bring your Discover card and just put it right on the top stair right there. Just follow my lead. Just drop it right there and turn and face me. I'm going to pray for you as you come. You will not be the only one. You do not have to be held hostage by what has happened in your past. You do not. Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus' name means deliverer. That's what he does. He brings deliverance. Come on close to the steps so that people can line up behind you. I'm going to pray for every single one of you. I want to give you just a moment. You don't have to walk back home with a burden in your heart. You can be set free. Jesus will do that right now. Thank you, Father. I'm going to ask those of you 
who didn't come, if you have a friend up here and you can see your friend, just kind of extend your hand in that way so that you're praying for them. It's a little bit of a spiritual connection with what Jesus is doing in their life right now. Jesus, all across this front are men and women who in one way or another have experienced the futility of being held hostage in their mind by what happened in the past, unfulfilled expectations, disappointments, where the devil lied to them and said, God never showed up for you. He blew it. He made a mistake. Your life would be better if God kept his promises, but he doesn't keep his promises. And we're here to declare openly that we trust you even when we don't understand. We trust you when we don't know because your love is trustworthy. So we choose to walk in freedom. We choose to bring our heart to you for full healing, for full restoration, for full completeness so that our next chapter will not be tainted by the disappointment and the pain of the last one. Thank you for that, Jesus. Those of you who are up front, I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, thank you for being my deliverer. Thank you for setting me free. I am no longer a hostage to my past. I am hopeful about my future. Keep me close to you so that I will always know you are working no matter what the circumstances tell me. I trust you because you love me. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing that prayer. In your good name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.